We start by defining the nodal evil predicate. So as the name suggests, the NAE predicate is evaluated to one when the inputs are not all equal and it's zero when the inputs are all equal. So here the input variables are Boolean variables and we assume that they take values in minus one, one. So the max NAE set problem is just the constraint satisfaction problem defined by the NAE predicate. But more specifically, an instance of max NAE set consists of a finite set of Boolean variables, x1 to xn, and a finite set of clauses where each clause is a not all equal predicate applied to a subset of variables or negated variables. And the goal of this problem is to find an assignment that satisfies as many clauses as possible. So a few remarks. So we can actually assign a non-negative weight to each clause and we usually do it in such a way that the sum of the weight is equal to one. So we can talk about stuff like sampling a clause or expected value of a solution and so on. And we can restrict this problem to certain clause lengths. For S, a set of natural numbers, we let max NAE S set to be the problem where all clause lengths are from S. And we can change NAE predicates to other predicates to get definitions for other CSPs. So let's look at an example. Suppose we have four Boolean variables, x1 to x4, and four clauses, NAE2 of x1, x2, NAE2 of x2, x3, NAE2 of x3, x4, and NAE2 of x4, x1. So for this instance, we can actually think of these uh, variables as vertices in a graph and clauses as edges. And uh, what we need to do is to uh, essentially color, uh, assign one or minus one, or give two colors to this, uh, uh, to this graph so that the number of edges across different colors is maximized. And for this instance, we can actually satisfy all these clauses. And as you have probably realized, this is just a max cut problem. So max cut is max NAE2 set with no negated variable, or more generally max NAE K set with no negated variable is the max so hypergraph cut in k uniform hypergraphs. The max not or equal set problem is also very closely related to the max set problem, which is the CSP defined by the or predicate. So the claim that max k set is actually reducible to max NAE k plus one set. Now the idea is very simple. We just add a special variable x naught and for every k set clause, we add in x naught to create an NAE k plus one set clause. And why does this work? So given an assignment to the NAE set instance, we have two cases. If x naught is equal to false, then we just do nothing. In this, and, 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 and in this case, in order for the NAE set clause to be satisfied, at least uh, because x naught is already false, at least one literal among L1 to LK should be true which means the original k set class is true. And if x naught is equal to true, we just flip the assignment. And here the observation is that the NAE predicate is an even predicate, meaning that if we have a solution and we flip it, it's still a solution uh, because you know, a set of variables are not all equal if and only if the negations are not all equal. So if we flip the assignment, we just get back to the first case. And, uh, and this, this reduction preserves the number of clauses. So if we have an approximation algorithm for max NAE k plus one set, it will immediately give an approximation algorithm for max k set with the same approximation guarantee. So the question we wanna ask is, what is the approximation ratio of max NAE set? And just to make sure we're on the same page, the approximation ratio is defined to be the maximum over all polynomial time algorithm A, and the minimum over all instance phi, the ratio between the performance of A on phi and the value of the optimal solution to phi. So what do we know about this algorithm? Uh, what, do we, what, what, do we, what do we know about this question? So previously, uh, for hardness result, Hallstatt showed that the ratio of seven eighth plus epsilon is MP hard for three set. And by our previous reduction, it's also hard for NAE4 set. 
And any four set is a subproblem of max any set. So a ratio of seven eighth is uh, the essentially best we can hope for for max any set. But on the other hand, we actually know there is a seven eighth approximation algorithm for every individual clause length. So what are these algorithms? So when k is equal to two or three, it is known that an SDP followed by a hyperplane rounding achieves a ratio of 0.878, which is a little bit above 7 eighth. And for k is at least four, a random assignment will achieve a ratio of one minus one over two to the k minus one. So this is the probability that a, that a clause is satisfied by a random assignment. So as a note, um, so for k equals two, this is known to be uh, optimal assuming the unique assuming the unique games conjecture. And for k is at least four, this is also optimal assuming k is not equal to np, but for k equals three, we actually have a better algorithm. So the question now becomes, well, can we sort of combine this uh, different clauses and design a seven eighth algorithm that works for all lengths? So our result is the following. It is actually unique games hard to achieve a 0.8739 approximation. So this is a little bit below 7 eighth for max NE35 set. So this is the problem where we allow clauses of size three and five. So in the following of this talk, I will first introduce uh, Raghavendra's SDP relaxation for constraint satisfaction problems and a generic family of rounding schemes called RPR squared rounding schemes. And then I'll discuss the notion of moment functions of RPR squared rounding schemes. And this will be a key concept in our proof. And finally, I will briefly sketch the proof of our result. So any questions so far? Okay, great, let's move on. So let me talk about the STP approach to CSPs. So I believe this originated from the Gomez and Williamson work on max cut. So they gave the following uh, semi-definite programming relaxation for max cut. So given a graph G, we have, an, we have an SDP variable VI, which is a vector value variable for every vertex I. And the goal of the SDP is to maximize the sum over all edge IJ, one minus VI dot VJ over two, subject to the condition that all these vectors are unit length. So this is a relaxation because an integer solution corresponds to uh, one dimensional vectors. So for one dimensional unit vectors is either one or minus one and this will induce a cut in the graph. And this SDP can be solved uh, within, our, within arbitrary precision in polynomial time. So the first step of the Gomez and Williamson algorithm is to solve this SDP and get a bunch of vectors. And the second step is to turn these vectors into integral solutions. So for this, they used so-called hyperplane rounding, which is the following procedure. We sample a random Gaussian vector R, and if R dot VI is positive, we set XI to be one. And if, if R dot VI is negative, we set XI to be minus one. So this is called hyperplane rounding because we can think of the Gaussian vector R as, a, as the normal uh, vector of a hyperplane. So vectors on one side of the hyperplane will be assigned one and vectors on the other side will be assigned minus one. And Gomez and Williamson showed that gives, this gives a 0.878 approximation to max cut. And this was a great improvement because prior to this work, I believe the best was like, uh, the best algorithm for max cut was like one half plus some little, little of one. And so this was a great improvement and people were inspired by this and they tried to came up with all kinds of different STPs for different CSPs. But as it turns out, there's, there's actually a one canonical STP relaxation that works for all constraint satisfaction problems. And uh, more specifically, Raghavendra showed that there is uh, what he calls basic STP that is essentially optimal assuming the unique games conjecture. So, what he means by this is that the integrality gap curve of the basic SDP is essentially the same as the unique games hardness curve. So here the integrality gap curve is defined to be the function S of C, which is the infimum 
of the optimum value of phi over all instances phi with SP value C. And the UG hardness curve is the function U of C, which is the best polynomial time achievable value on instances with optimal value C, assuming the unique games conjecture. So Raghavendra showed that these two functions are, are essentially the same. And let me tell you uh, the intuition of, of this basic SDP. So what he does is that it first searches for a set of global biases and pairwise biases, bi and pij, and their intended meanings are, so bi is intended to mean the expected value of the variable xi, and bij is intended to mean the expected value of the product xi times xj, and then the SP locally searches, so for every clause CI, the SP locally searches for a distribution of assignments that, that matches this biases and pairwise biases. So the, so the first moment of this distribution is given by BI, and the second moment of this distribution is given by BIJ, and it maximizes the probability that the clause CI is satisfied by this distribution. And the goal of the SP is to maximize the sum of these probabilities. So let me illustrate, illustrate this intuition with the uh, Gomez and Williamson SDP. So I wanna show that G, the GW SDP is actually the basic SDP for max cut problem. So the first step is to search for biases and pillars biases. So here biases are actually not needed because uh, max cut is an even CSP. So if we have, if we have, if, if we have a, an assignment and we flip it, then we just get an assignment with the same quality. So there's no reason for, for a variable to be biased against one or minus one. So we can assume that every variable has a zero bias. And the pairwise bias bij, here it's given by the dot product bi dot bj. So the next step is to search for a local distribution that maximizes this uh, uh, probability that this edge is cut. And here, as it turns out, that if we have the PLS bias, then the probability of this edge being cut is already determined because the edge ij is cut if and only if xi times xj equals minus one. So the probability that this edge is cut is equal to the probability that xi times xj is equal to minus one, which is equal to one minus bij over two. Okay, so this is the probability that this edge is cut under this local uh, uh, assignment. And then the goal of the SP is to maximize the sum of the probabilities. And that's exactly what we're doing here in the Gomez and Williamson SDP. Okay, so after we have the basic SDP, we, we fit in the CSP instance and we'll get a bunch of biases and uh, pairwise biases. And the next step is to come up with a rounding scheme, which is an algorithm that turned these biases and the last biases into integral solutions. Okay. So let me talk about there's this, this uh, generic family of rounding schemes called RPR squared rounding scheme. So RPR squared stands for random projection followed by randomized rounding. And it's proposed by Feig and Lamberg in 2001. So the RPR squared works as follows. It chooses a function f, which maps a real number to uh, minus one, to the, to the interval minus one, one. And given vectors b, b, b1 to bn, so these are fb vectors, it samples a random Gaussian vector r. And the first step, random projection, is that it computes uh, for every i, the projection of vi onto r. So it's the dot product of vi dot r. And the second step, random rounding for every i, it independently assign xi equals one with probability one plus f of ti over two, and xi equals minus one with probability one minus f of ti over two. So this uh, RPR squared rounding scheme captures uh, a lot of rounding schemes that we mentioned earlier. So for hyperplane rounding, <coughs> it's the same as the RPR square rounding scheme using the sine function. So if this uh, projection is positive, then we assign the variable to be one with probability one, 
And if the projection is negative, we'll sign the variable to be minus one with probability one. And the random assignment corresponds to the RPR squared rounding scheme using the zero function. So no matter what, can, what the projection is, we'll assign the variable using an unbiased coin flip. So as you can see, these two functions are both odd functions and can actually show that uh, an optimal RBR squared function should, use, uh, should be odd. And there is a, a generalized version for the RBR squared, which is essentially a higher, higher dimension version. So instead of sampling one random direction, we can actually sample D random directions for some constant D. And the RPR squared we use, we now use a higher dimensional function uh, which maps a deep dimensional vector to the integral minus one one. And now for every, for every variable i, we compute uh, d different projections and feed these projections into the function f. Uh, which, so, so the idea is essentially the same. We just, uh, we just turn this into a higher dimensional version. So as a note, Raghavendra actually used this uh, idea, the generalized RPR squared to give a optimal rounding scheme to the basic SDP. But that uh, rounding scheme, it's, uh, so the proof of the optimality is indirect, uh, indirect. <clears throat> so it tells us nothing about the approximation ratio. So now let's move on to the moment functions of RPR squared rounding schemes. So how can we analyze RPR squared rounding scheme? So one observation is that how a group of variables are rounded depends only on their pairwise biases. Or if we view this geometrically, how a group of vectors are rounded has nothing to do with the locations of other vectors. So it's determined and it's, it's determined only by the locations of this, the relative locations of these vectors and that's given by these pairwise biases. Since so inspired by this uh, observation, we define the moment functions as follows. So for RPR squared around the scheme, with function f, we define its uh, kth moment function, denoted capital F sub k, bracket f. So this is a function on uh, k choose two inputs, which are the uh, PRS biases among these k uh, vectors, to be the expected value of this monomial xi times x2 times dot 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 times xk. And uh, if we're, since we're using RPR squared function, this is also uh, equal to the respective value of r, f of vi dot r times f of v2 dot r dot 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 f of vk dot r. So here the vi's are unit vectors uh, such that their pairwise biases are defined by the uh, their pairwise dot products are defined by these pairwise biases, and xi is the variable obtained by rounding vi. And we have a few remarks. So first of all, we uh, we omit f, bracket f, if the meaning is clear from context. And this definition should also work for more general rounding schemes. And in general, uh, the moment function should be a function on both biases and pairwise biases. So in our case, for not all equal predicate. We can assume the biases are zero, so we can uh, just omit this from the input arguments. But in general, uh, the moment function is also affected by biases. So let's look at a few examples. For example, suppose, well, we have a more general problem where we have biases. So we, we can do epsilon bi biased rounding, which is the following procedure for every variable xi we independently assign xi equals one with probably one plus epsilon bi over two and xi equals minus one with probability one minus, eps one minus epsilon bi over two. So we can compute this, uh, the moment functions for this rounding scheme very easily. So it's kth moment fk, which by definition is equal to the expected value of xi times xk times dot 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 times xk. And by the independence of our rounding scheme, this just uh, this this is equal to the product of the expected value of these variables, which uh, so the expected value of xi is 
equal to epsilon vi. So the value of the kth moment is equal to epsilon to the k and then the product of this uh, biases. And if we set epsilon to be zero, this will correspond to the uniform, the, uh, the unbiased one uh, random assignment. So as we can see from this formula, if we set epsilon to be zero, then all the kth moment is equal to zero. So, uh, so, so the, for the random assignment, all the moment functions are zero. There's another example. Let's compute the F2 of uh, hyperplane rounding. Okay, so uh, recall that the hyperplane rounding is, is the following procedure. And by definition, F2 of Bij is equal to the expected value of Xi times Xj, where their corresponding uh, SB vectors Vi and Vj has dot product Bij. So x i x j, they're one minus one variables. So their product is either one or minus one. So to compute F2, let's just look at the probability that this, uh, this, this product is equal to minus one. And this is the probability that V i and V j lie in different sides of the hyperplane. And I believe you have probably all seen this. So if you have two vectors, V i and V j, with dot product bi with dot product bij, then the angle between them is given by r cosine of bij, and the probability that a random that a random hyperplane goes through this angle is r cosine of bij divided by pi. Okay, so this is the probability that xi times sj is equal to minus one, and to compute f two of bij is simply one minus two times this probability, which is equal to one minus two times r cosine of bij divided by pi. And this is the plot of this uh, function. As you can see, this, uh, this is a nice looking function. It's, it's, it's monotone, it's monotonically increasing. It's, uh, it's an odd function and it's, uh, it's, a, it's a convex function in the interval zero one. It's a concave function in the interval minus one, minus one zero. So we will see this plot again later. Okay. So the question now is how to use these moment functions. So why, why did we define these moment functions? And the, result is, uh, and the answer is uh, to use, we can combine this with the Fourier expansion. So we know that every Boolean function can be written as a multilinear polynomial. For example, Na2 of x1, x2 is equal to one minus x1 times xk over two. So this is the same as max cut. And for Na3, uh, it's equal to three minus x1, x2 minus x1, x3 minus x2, x3 and all divided by four. And you can verify this very easily. So if all the inputs x1, x2, x3 are equal, then all these three pairwise products are equal to one. So it becomes three minus three over four, which is equal to zero. And if they're not all equal, that means there's one variable that's different from the other two. So two of these pairwise products will be minus one and one of these pairwise products will be one. So it's three plus two minus one over four, which is one. And in general, the Fourier expansion for NAEK is, the, is given by two to the K minus one minus one, and then you subtract all the, all the products with an even number of variables. And then all of this divide by two to the K minus one. Okay. So what we can do is we can think of this uh, X1 to Xn as random variables because they are the outputs of the random scheme, which is probabilistic. And then we can take expected value on the Fourier expansion. So the expected value of this uh, NAE2 class is equal to one minus the expected value of Xi times X1 times X2 over two. And the same goes for NAE3. So here we use the, the linearity of expectation and so on. So here the expected value of Xi 
times xj. If you use a RPR squared function, this is the same as expected value of f times bi dot r, f of bi dot r times f of bj dot r. And this is by definition uh, the f2 of bij. So the, the idea that I'm trying to convey here is that the expected value of our rounding scheme can be expressed in terms of the moment functions, okay? So let's do this. Uh, let's do this for the uh, NAE predicates. So for NAE2, it can be expressed as one minus F2 of B12 over two. And for NAE3, it can be expressed as three minus F2 of B12, minus F2 of B13, minus F2 of B23, and divided by four. For NAE4, in addition to F2, we also have an expression involving F4. So F4, as you can see here, it's a, it's a function with six inputs. So, so in order to analyze the expected value of our rounding scheme uh, on these clauses, it suffices to analyze the behavior of these moment functions. So let's look at uh, F2 first. So, we do, so what do we know about F2? So as it turns out, F2 is actually pretty well understood. Uh, it's the same as the Gaussian noise stability function. So given a function f, the Gaussian noise stability of f at b is defined to be the uh, expected value of f, f of z times f of z prime, where z and z prime are standard Gaussian variables with correlation b. So as you can see, this, this expression is very similar to our definition of f2. So, uh, the, the following, we have the following simple fact. If vi and vj are two unit vectors with dot product b, and r is a standard Gaussian vector, then vi dot r and vj dot r are standard Gaussian variables with correlation b. So f2 of b, which is equal to the expected value of r, f of vi dot r times f of vj dot r, is just the same as the definition of the stability, the, the Gaussian noise stability of F at B. Okay. And we actually know a lot about the Gaussian noise stability. So suppose F is an odd function, then F2 of B, which is the same as stability of F at B, can be written as an infinite series, uh, infinite power series with only odd powers and non-negative coefficients. So immediately follows, that f2 of b is an odd function and it's non negative, it's non decreasing, and it's convex on the interval 0, 1. So we have computed the f2 of hyperplane rounding earlier, and you can see this, this matches all these descriptions. So the f2 for the hyperplane rounding is, is actually, a, it's, it's actually an increasing function. And it's convex on zero one. It's non-negative on zero one. It's concave. It's concave on minus one zero. So knowing F two, uh, so to analyze uh, NA two or max cut, uh, it suffices to analyze F two. So using the properties described earlier, Adano and Wu showed that the hardest distribution for max cut is supported on at most two points, one and some negative row. So here by hardest distribution, I mean the hardest, hardest distribution of uh, clauses. And for max cut, the clause is you know, the same as its uh, KOS bias. So this is essentially saying that for the hardest, for the hardest instance for max cut, it has only two types of KOS biases, either one or some uh, negative row. And why is this? So recall that it's the expected value of NA2 is given by one minus F2 over two, and the STP value is one minus Bij over two. And the idea is, that, is to keep the sum of Bij invariant while increasing the sum of F2 of Bij. Okay, so if we keep the sum of Bij invariant, that means the STP value is fixed. And if we increase F2, that will just decrease the expected value of our rounding scheme, which means the, the problem becomes harder. Okay. For example, suppose 
we have, a, suppose we have two uh, different negative biases. Uh, we can, what we can do is just we take their, uh, we take their average and that will keep the sum of biases invariant. But since this function F2 is concave, when uh, it's concave on negative inputs, if we take their average, that increases F2. So that will decrease the value of our rounding scheme. So this shows that uh, for the hardest point, we can only have one uh, negative bias. And that's just an example. So in our work, we extended this analysis to any three set and obtained the, uh, the, uh, the approximation curve for max, for max n equally set. But that's not the main focus today. We, under, we want to analyze three five set. So to understand classes with length at least three, uh, uh, length greater than three, we need to analyze F4. As it turns out, F4 is actually very difficult to analyze. And one reason is that F4 has six inputs because F4 is the moment of four variables and we have four choose two equals six different pillars biases. And uh, it's, and it behaves very strangely uh, for example, we know that F2 of X is non-negative on non-negative inputs, but for some running scheme, F4 can be negative on positive inputs. So it's, uh, so it's uh, a weird behaving function. So one, uh, one possible way to simplify this is to consider F4 when, the all, when all the input biases are equal and uh, in, in, this case, we, in this case, we can actually prove something. So we show that when, the, when all the input biases are equal, uh, suppose we have this x, which is uh, between zero and one, then f4 of all x is at least f2 of x squared. Okay, so this is our key lemma on f4. And the, and the proof is uh, not difficult. So let's take n vectors v1 to vn, with pairwise dot product x. Now this is uh, achievable because we can just let these vectors share a common component of length square root of x and let them be orthogonal beyond that. And uh, we round these n vectors and obtain random variables x1 to xn. Then we have f2, so I omit the inputs here. So f2, f2 of x, is equal to the expected value of xi times xj, and f4 is equal to the expected value of xi times xj times xh times xl. So here, these, uh, these indices are distinct. And we have the following inequality. So the expected value of sum of xi's to the fourth is at least the expected value of some sum of xi squared and then the whole thing squared. Well, this is true because, well, the difference uh, between the left-hand side and right-hand side is equal to the variance of the sum of xi squared, okay? So let's count the number of f4s and f2s and, and f2 squares in this inequality. So for the, for the right-hand side, expected value of uh, so the sum of xi squared, as you can see, it's actually equal to n plus n times n minus one times f2, because xi's are one minus one variables. So if we have a term of xi squared, it's just going to be one. And if we have xi times xj with distinct i and j, it's going to be a f2. So it's, uh, so this term, so from this term, we have the n squared times n minus one squared times f2 squared, this many f2 squares, plus some lower order terms. And we can do the same thing to the left-hand side. For the left-hand side, we have n times n minus one times n minus two times n minus three f4, and then plus some lower order terms. And then uh, the lemma will just follow by, by dividing both sides of the inequality by n to the fourth, and then let n go to infinity. Then the, the lower auto term will be gone and we'll be left with F2, F4 is at least F2 squared. Any questions?
Okay, let's move on. So now we're ready to give a, a proof of our result. It's unit games hard to achieve a 0.8739 approximation for max and an E35 set. Recall that by Raghavendra, it suffices to construct an integral to gap instance for the basic SDP. So I'll put the uh, Fourier expansions for NE3 and NE5 here. So for NE3, we put in uh, a lot of times. For NE5, it's equal to 15 minus all the pairwise biases, uh, minus all the pairwise products, and then minus all the fourwise products, and then whole thing divided by 16. Okay, so we want to choose a, we want to construct a, a, a distribution of clauses. So let's do it. So for any three set, let's consider the clause with pairwise biases all equal to minus one third. And for this clause, the STP can come up with the following distribution of satisfying assignments. So we basically take the average of the assignment where, it is, where there is exactly one true little wrong. Okay, so this is a so so this is a distribution of satisfying assignment, meaning that the SDP will consider this clause to be perfectly satisfied, and uh, let's verify that this matches our pairwise biases. So, for example, let's look at x one and x two. <coughs> then, with probably one third, they they with, pro with probably two thirds, they have different signs, and with probably one third, they have the same sign. So, the respective value of the respective value is uh, minus one third. Okay, so, so this matches our pairwise biases. And for any five set, let's consider the clause with pairwise biases bij equals one third for ij between one and four and bi5 equals to zero for i between one and four. So for this distribution, uh, for this uh, for this pairwise biases, the SDP can find the following uh, find the following distribution of satisfying assignments. Again, it's a satisfying assignment on the uh, it's a there's a distribution on the assignments where we only have the one okay, where we have exactly one true bit row. So let's verify that this matches our pairwise bias. So for for example, take x one x two. With probability one third, we have different signs. So in the first two assignments, we have different signs. But with probability two thirds, the last three assignments, they have the same sign. So the respective value of x up, x one times x two is equal to one third, which is the same as the uh, same as the plus bias. And uh, let's take uh, x four and x five. Then in the first three assignments, they have the same sign, which have which have weight one one half. And the last two assignments, they have, the, they have different signs, which also have weight one half. So the expected value of x4 times x5 is equal to zero. So this matches our pairwise biases. And since this is a distribution of satisfying assignments, the SP again thinks that this, this clause is perfectly satisfied. Okay, now we can express the value using moment functions. So for any three set, this is given by three minus three times F2 of minus one third divided by four, okay? And since F2 is an odd function, this is equal to three plus three times F2 of one third divided by four. And for an A5 set, <coughs> it's equal to 15 minus six times F2 of one third minus F4 of all one thirds, and then all divided by 16. So here we actually use a very simple fact that any moment involving x5 is going to is going to be zero because all the pairwise biases involving x5 is zero. So that's a very simple fact, very easy to prove. And then using our key lemma, we have this is a most 15 minus six times f2 of one third minus f2 of one third squared, and then divided by 16. So we have expressed uh, the value of our rounding scheme on these two clauses in using just one variable, which is f2 of one third. And the following, uh, and then it's clear what, which, what we should do next. We just uh, try to find the minimum of this, uh, 
two functions. So let t be f to the one third. We plot these two functions here. So the blue line three plus three t over four is for the NE three class. And the red curve fifteen minus six t minus t squared divided by sixteen is for the five five set class. NE five set class. So you can see that these two. Uh, so the y axis. So the y coordinate for the intersection of these two, these two curves is about 0.8739. So what this means is that no matter what running scheme you use, no matter, uh, no matter what IPR squared function you use, no matter what F2 of one third is, you're going, to, uh, you're, you're going to perform worse than 0.8739 on either a three class or five class. Okay, so this essentially shows that no RPR squared function can do better than 0.8739 on this distribution of classes. Well, but that's, that's uh, so that's the intuition for this uh, proof, but to make this uh, formal, we still need to construct a gap instance. And uh, that's what we're going to do next. So one idea is to consider the unit sphere as set of variables can sample the classes with the same distribution of pairwise biases. And what do I mean by this? So for example, if we want an NA3 set class with pairwise biases minus one third, minus one third, minus one third, and we just sample three vectors from the sphere with pairwise dot product minus one third. And we can translate our arguments, our previous arguments in terms of actual assignments to the unit sphere. So as you can see that this, if we take the unisphere as set of variables, then it's this, then this uh, vector, this, this vector themselves form an SP solution. So this construction preserves the integral uh, with the SP value. And if we can prove, uh, if we can translate our argument uh, to, to lower bound the performance of actual assignments, and that will obtain, and that, that means we will obtain an integral together. But however, this is an infinite instance, so it has infinitely many variables. So we need to discretize. So in our case, it's actually very easy to discretize because we only have we only have just deal with one PRS bias, which is one third. So we can handpick the points from the sphere. So let V be the set of points in Rn with exactly three non-zero coordinates, which being either one over square root over square root of three or minus one over square root of three. Okay, so suppose now we want to sample k vectors with pairwise bias one third. So we can use the following distribution, which we call dk. So we sample 2k plus one distinct indices and 2k plus one independent coin flips. And uh, we just let this, let this uh, vectors share one same index and then use two new index after that, so maybe it helps to visualize this in a table. So all these vectors will share this same index i1 and they have the same sign on it. And then every, every vector we use to new, to new indices. So this distribution, using this, using, using this distribution, we can sample k vectors with pairwise bias one third. And we can translate our key lemma as follows. Given an actual assignment A, we define F2 to be expected value over V1, V2 sampled from V2. So they have pairwise bias one third, A of V1 times A of V2. So essentially we just changed uh, in, the original, in, in the original definition, we have uh, RPR squared function F, we changed that to an actual assignment A. And similarly for F4, it's equal, it's equal to the expected value of V1, V2, V3, V4 sampled from D4 and the, and the corresponding point. We can prove in a similar way that F4 is at least F2, F2 squared. And now we need to sample the clauses. It's, it's the five clauses, it's pretty simple. We just sample uh, four clauses, uh, four vectors from D4, and they will have pairwise bias one, one third. Then sample V5 that doesn't share any non-zero coordinate with, v, with the previous four vectors. So it will be orthogonal to the first four vectors. And we output NAE5 uh, on these five vectors. And uh, we can show that 
given an assignment A, expected value on this distribution is 15 minus six F2 minus F4 over 16. So same as, same as before. And sampling, and sampling of three classes is a little bit uh, more complicated because now we want, the, we want them to have bias minus one third. So what we do is we sample six distinct indices, I1 to I6, and sample six independent coin flips, B1 to B6, and then assign them according to this expression. Again, it might help to uh, visualize this in this table. So essentially, for any pair of vectors, we want them to share exactly one non-zero coordinate on which they have different signs. Okay, so they will have uh, pairwise. They will have a dot product minus one third. And again, oops, and again, given an assignment A. Its expected value on this distribution is three plus three times F2 over four. It's again, same as before. So let's wrap up. So we end up with the same expressions, the same expression for three class, the same expression for five class, and the same expression for the key landmark. So we can uh, just <coughs> translate our previous argument very easily here. And, but this time we conclude that no actual assignment can do better than Point A seven three nine, but SDP thinks that this is perfectly satisfiable. So this gives a, 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 an, an integrated gap instance, and this completes our proof. Any questions? Can you say something about? How do you go from RPR square rounding to no assignment doing better than 0.8739? So, uh, let me go back to the, so we have defined the F2 and F4 differently here. So now in the definition, we changed the, the, the it's originally, the definition of F2, it was, originally it was in terms of uh, RPR square functions. But now we changed into actual assignments. So now uh, in order to prove this, we just say we take an actual assignment and then we have this F2 and the, we have F4 and we express the value of our learning schemes in terms of F2 and F4 and the same argument will apply. Thanks. Uh, the, 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 uh, there's a question in chat. Oh. Could you remind me where? Yes, yes. So by Ragavendra's result, if we have an integrated gap instance, and that would imply uh, the UG harness. Okay, I still have a few more minutes. So let me show you uh, some experimental results that we have. So as I mentioned earlier, we have determined the approximation curve for max n reset. So it's shown in this figure. So the x axis is the completeness C and the y axis is the, the soundness S. So this graph essentially saying on uh, instances with optimum value C, uh, we can do a we can achieve a ratio of, uh, we can achieve a value of S. So the approximation ratio for this, for any three set is approximately 0 0.9089. And we also tried to find the optimal RPR squared function for satisfiable uh, max NAE, in, in, max NAE set instance. So max, for, for max NAE three five set, we get, the, we get this step function. So it achieves a conjectured ratio of 0.8729. So it's very close to our upper bound, which is 0.8739. But we, but we don't know how to prove this, how to rigorously prove this ratio. And what's cool about this is that it's a, it's a step function. So previously, 
people only use the not uh, people only use the monotone functions for RBL squared. So it turns out that uh, being non-monotone here actually helps, seems to help. And uh, for NAE 378 set, so we allow clauses of three of size three, seven, and eight, we have this step function. So it achieves a conjecture ratio of point a six nine eight. So we believe that this configuration is actually the hardest for, for satisfiable max NAE set because by adding in uh, more clauses of different size, the ratio doesn't seem to be affected. Okay, so let me end this talk with a few open problems. So again, what's the approximation of uh, the approximation ratio for max NAE set? And can we give a better analysis of F4 and higher moment functions? So finally, apply this method to other predicates. So that's it. Thanks for your attention. Okay, uh, we can um, give a virtual round of applause for them. Thank you. Uh, now, questions, please. Uh, Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Okay. So you said max uh, satisfiable max NA three and five. So satisfy. Did you also investigate satisfiable max NA three sat? Just NA three sat because, or do you think that the known algorithm for that is optimal? So so we have so this approximation curve for uh, max NA three sat. Mm -hmm. So add so this includes the case for satisfiable instances. So the worst case is for satisfiable? Huh. For this problem, no, no. The worst case is around completeness of 0.9 something. I don't know exactly. Like, I guess for satisfiable is, I guess the bound remains the same as the previous thing, so. I was just wondering if you get any improvement for the satisfiable case also, or at that point, the value is the same as the previous uh, known things. I'm not sure if there's any previous work that was, that focused only on satisfiable and increasing. Okay, thanks. Okay, any more questions, please? Um, Yago, did you have a question there? Um, okay, so naive, naive question. question. <laughs> Just wondering why you're calling these uh, Fourier expansions. Uh, they don't look like Fourier expansions to me, so maybe I just don't understand. What <laughs> known as the discrete Fourier expansion. So yeah, I'm not, maybe they can come up with a different name, but uh, that's how it's called in the literature. Okay. Are you happy there? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right. Uh, any more questions, please? Um, so, Nyang, when you uh, when you say you want to apply it to um, other uh, types of predicates, uh, what sort of results uh, would you be aiming for? Well, the, the next uh, predicate we're trying to look at is Maxat. So, uh, but Maxat is more difficult because it's not an even CSP. So it's, uh, so we also have biases. So the moment functions, now it's even more difficult to analyze because even for F2, you will have three 
three inputs, bi, bj, and bij. So the knowledge on Gaussian noise stability is no longer enough. And uh, yeah, we don't have much result there right now. Uh, okay, yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, apparently, Libra has a question. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Uh, so, my question is you allow negations uh, as predicates. Uh, so you have not only con, you can use negations. What, uh, what if you don't use negations? That's like you cannot apply your methods at all, or? Yeah, that's a good thing. Uh, Yeah, I haven't thought about that, so I need a little bit more time to think about it. Okay, any more questions for you, please? One last chance. Okay, so it seems uh, there are no further questions. So uh, let's um, uh, thank uh, Niang again. Thank you, Niang. Very interesting talk. Uh, cool. So um, next week, <laughs> uh, next week uh, we have a talk the same same day, same time, and uh, the speaker will be uh, uh, who's the speaker. Aditya Patakuchin. So, um, yep, yeah, see you all uh, next week. <laughs>